Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Nick. I'm the pastor here. I want to welcome all those watching online this morning. We are glad you're joining us. Before I get started too much, I want to encourage you. I don't do this a lot. Take your phone out if you've got a cell phone uh, and take that out really quickly. I want to announce something we've been working on for several, several months now, uh, and it's a new website. I want to encourage you to go there. We We designed it specifically for cell phones. Uh, and if you've been here with us for, for a while, you know that every single week we have announcements, we have several things going on, and it felt like for us for a while that it was like, listen, if you want to get baptized, you can sign up through the app, or you know, if you want to serve, you can talk to Jan, or, or if you want to do something else, you can go to the website. If you want to listen to a sermon, you can go check out you know, the app or website or whatever. We had all these different kind of things, and we're really transferring, starting today, into this thing. It's riverlakechurch.info, and literally every single next step, no matter what it is, no matter who, who says it, no matter what a weekend it is, goes through that, that you no longer have to worry about, should I talk to somebody, or should I email somebody, or is it on the website, or is it on the app, or where is it at? You know, we're going to still have some of those options available, but at the end of the day, we just wanted to make it simple and easy for you, that if you just feel like you're supposed to take a next step, whatever that is. If we offer it, it will be on this, and we're going to have counters. So if you miss a week and you're like, hey, what's going on? I don't remember. When is that event and what's happening? Everything that we do, every next step will be on this website moving forward. And if you don't have a smartphone, uh, which who doesn't have a smartphone? Just kidding. No, don't raise your hand. Uh, that would be embarrassing for you. No, if you don't have a smartphone, though, we do have a kiosk out front that you can go in there, and maybe you've got a question about how to sign up for something or whatever. We've got somebody manning that out there uh, after services that you can go in and step up and kind of do that. And so anyway, we're excited about this. I want to encourage you to check it out. And so that's what's going on there. So you all ready to go? That was pathetic. Okay, try that again. You ready to go? There we go. That was awesome. Okay, cool. Hey. We are wrapping up today our series that we spent the last eight weeks. This might be the longest series I've ever done. Uh, Eight weeks, this is what we do. And what we've said from the beginning is this. There are two types of people. There are the people that talk about what they believe, and there are the people that live out what they believe. And as we talk through what do we want to communicate this summer, we have some core values that really we believe communicate what we believe by what we do, not just what we say. So we're in the middle of a series entitled, This is What We Do, because we believe that what we do communicates way more importantly and way more clearly what we value than what we just say. And so we're in the middle of the series, and today I want to talk about a core value that you inherently get. In fact, you get it so obviously, no one's going to write it down, no one's going to do it, and yet we miss it when it comes to the church. And it's so messed up. And it has to do with food. Now, how many of you, really quickly, how many of you like to eat? Yeah, exactly. That's what I thought. There's a reason McDonald's is still open. Okay, let's be honest, all right? Yeah, yeah. I love, I love food, okay? And I'm one of those people, okay? I like it. I know I'm, I'm working on this right now, okay? But I love food, love to eat, love to eat, and not just eat a little bit, love to eat lots, okay? So just being really honest and transparent, uh, love food. And one of the things is about me, if you need to know me, if we ever go out to dinner, you know, if we're ever hanging out, you ever come to my house, I order the exact amount of food that I plan on eating, okay? That is a very nice way to say Joey doesn't share food, okay? Anybody, anybody get that friend's reference right there? Yeah, yeah. Nick doesn't share food ever, okay? Like ever. My wife and I, we go through this because we'll go to the store. We'll go to the drive-thru. Hey, you want anything? No, I don't want anything. Cool. I'll take and I'll order. 30 seconds later. Well, that smells really good. Yeah, stinks to be you, okay, because you didn't order anything. Okay, this is mine, okay? Don't even look at it. Don't smell it. This, it's my breath. You know, like just get away because it's my, I don't share. I don't like to share food, okay? It's my deal. And we've walked through those issues, and we've walked through those problems, and she finally gets it a little bit right now. She still tries a little bit, but I don't share. Here's the tension. I didn't share until I had children, okay? (laughs) There's something about children. I don't know what it is. They're not even polite about it, right? I mean, I've got a, I got one of my youngest is going to be two next month. He's, he just walks up and he's like, bite. Like, that's it. It doesn't even ask polite. There's no please. There's no thank you. I mean, my middle child, Claire, she's so awesome. She'll walk up and she's, she knows how to work me so well. She'll walk up to me like, oh, dad, that's a nice bottle of water. Do you like water? I really like water. Are you thirsty? I'm kind of thirsty. Have you ever thought about being thirsty? I'd like a drink of that. I mean, she's just so smooth. But my youngest, he don't care. He just, he's like, bite, you know. And I give it to him. 
And it's crazy because I remember the first time I shared food with my child, my wife about fell over. She's like, hold up, wait a minute, you don't share with me. And I'm like, ha, we'll work on you later, okay? That's fine, okay? But, you know, like, I, I love my kids. I adore my wife, all right? But I love my kids, that whole deal. And, and it's one of those things that I, listen, I will share food with my kids. I, it's crazy. I don't share drinks with my children. You know why? Because I don't like backwash. That's nasty, okay? So every time that I hear somebody say, hey, Dad, can I have a drink of that? What I really hear them saying is, can I have the rest of it? That's exactly the code right there. It's because once it goes that direction, it's not coming back this direction, okay? So I just, I kind of look at it and I'm like, ah. There, yeah, you can have a drink. You know, whole deal. Because I don't share. And, and, and the reality is, with my kids, though, I do share because, and it's really what I want to talk about today. Because, listen, we are, and here's, what we're gonna, here's how we're going to say it. We will sacrifice the things we love for those we love. Like, you get that. That is, that is not deep. No one's going to write that down. You instinctively, inherently understand that, you know what, especially when it comes to your kids, especially if you're in a good marriage, if you're not in a good marriage, we've got a sermon series for you in the fall, but, you know, if you're in a good marriage, you sacrifice the things you love for those you love. And no one has to teach you that. No one had to sit down with me. Well, I did get yelled at a little bit, but nobody had to sit down with me like, Nick, you really should share with your kids. You know, you just, as your love grows for people, whatever that is, you just instinctively sacrifice for them. And it doesn't bug you too much, and you don't think about it too much. And you know what? In some ways, man, if you're like a really great parent or really great spouse or whatever, you do it happily because when you really love something, the things that are around it, the things that can be so important, okay, if you don't have that relationship, the things that can be like, oh, this is my world and this is everything, all of a sudden just kind of fade away and you give into it because you get this, you do this. We all, we all sacrifice the things that we love for those we love. And it happens all the time. Now, here's what I want to talk about today. Because again, you get this, this is, this is our number one core value. And the reason it's our number one core value, and the reason why I want to unpack it right before we get ready to start a kick off a fall series, is because we understand it, we get it instinctively in every other area of our world, except church. There's this tension to sit back and get that and understand that and believe that. But when it comes to church, there is a tension for every single one of us to kind of all of a sudden shift it to, what do I get out of it? And I, I got to tell you, I've never thought that about my children. Have you ever thought that about your children? I've never, I've never looked at my child and thought, you know what, okay, you're two now, son. Um, this relationship is really seems one way. What are you providing for me? I, I don't think that. I don't, I don't think that about my spouse. I don't think that about my older kids. As a matter of fact, the relationships and things I love, I, really, there is joy, there is happiness that comes with just being in their presence, just being um, around them. And again, what I want to talk about today is I believe that there's, there's a tension for every single one of us, myself included, to look at the church very, very differently than we're called to. To walk up into the church and sit back and start to ask questions, what's in it for me? It, it, what do I get out of it? Do they have the right programs for me? Do they have the right opportunities for me? Does the pastor talk about what I like? Do they have Sunday school? Do they have small groups? Do they have them on the right times? Do they have them on the wrong times? What, where, am I getting fed? Is it going deep enough or is it going way too deep? Because sometimes you use like nice little middle ground. Is the sermon, is it, is it funny and relevant and helpful and practical, but is also deep and scriptural? Did he start with God and did he end with God? Okay, in the middle you might tell a joke, but not too many jokes because you don't want to be too funny. I mean, just all this kind of tension that we walk into churches with, that we instinctively just kind of judge it and do I like this and do I like the people where they're friendly enough and hold it. And really, I just, there's something about all of us. We just kind of miss the fact that at the core, Jesus died for the church. And the church, it's not the building, but it's us living life together, moving forward together, trying to change this city together. And if we're not careful, we will not live this out. Let me, let me just say it this way. There is a reason, I believe, that many churches in our country right now are struggling to make ends meet, are struggling to grow, and it has everything to do with this. It has everything to do with, at some point in time, the people, they started the church and they were passionate and they were going and they were going to reach the world and they were going to invite people and they were going to serve and they were going to give and they were going to write checks and show up early and stay late and they were going to sacrifice because they, they wanted to reach people. 
and just kind of happens, the excitement goes away, the passion goes away, the draw goes away, they just kind of get someone like, uh, we become inward focused. As a church, you need to understand, this will be the core value. We can, if we get this one right, we can get the other ones wrong, and it'll be okay. I believe we can get the other ones right, and if we get this one wrong, it will kill our church. And so before we get ready to walk into what I believe is going to be one of the most intense, exciting seasons for us as a church as we're getting ready to build a building and reach more people and going back to three services, I just wanted to remind you all today. Just today is a reminder on so many different levels, and there's going to be a lot of different points and kind of a shotgun kind of approach to this whole deal that we are called. If you're here today and you say, hey, this is my church. This is, I show up, I love this church. If you're a guest, hey, you just sit back and kind of relax and you kind of see what we value, what we don't. But if this is your church, I just want to remind you, hey, this is, this is what we call to do. This is what we're going to, this is what we want. We will sacrifice the things we love for those we love. And for anybody just to sit back and, and kind of go, well, man, I just, I think Nick's talking to me. Yes, I absolutely am, okay? <laughs> If you ever feel at this moment, I was talking to me. Yes, I absolutely am. So today, what I want to do is that I want to unpack two, I believe, obstacles that get in the way of us living this out. Because there are two obstacles that affect every single person in this room, myself included. And number one is this. Man, we just love things, don't we? Can we just own that? It's not very biblical. It's not very deep theological. I just like stuff. I really do. If I'm being really transparent, like, I, I, I'll tell you my thing. My thing is TVs, okay? I've, I've never walked into Best Buy and looked at the TV and thought, that is way too big. That is just ridiculous. Who would need I've never thought that. I have walked into Best Buy and thought, I'll bet if I knock out a wall, that would fit, okay? <laughs> I could do that. And, you know, my wife is going, stop it, you know, but I'm, I'm playing. I, this, I love things, okay? I'm just being really honest, okay? We're relevant, simple, real. This is the real part, okay? I just... I don't love all things, but there are certain things like I just, I, I just love that kind of stuff. Like I love technology. And, and you do too. You, there are things that you love. And again, in the church world, we're kind of taught sometimes, especially if you grew up in the church, like you're not supposed to love things. So we don't want to admit it, but just can, you, can we just be real today? There are certain things you love. It's, maybe not be TVs. Maybe it's cars. Maybe it's houses if you got a little bit more money. Maybe it's you've got something you like to collect. It's not even super expensive, but you just, you love to collect. You spend time on eBay or looking things up or whatever, and you, you go, you got like a bowl or a pot or something like that that you just love to collect and you love to do stuff like that. Maybe it's clothing. I'll tell you, I like clothing too. I can, I can spend some money on clothing. I love, I love shoes. I love clothing. I got my nice blonde shoes on today. Okay. I, I love clothing. I could, I could do that. Maybe, maybe for you, it's shoes. Maybe it's a hobby. And again, you don't think of your hobby as a thing, but, but there's this thing, and, and it takes a lot of your time. And, and, and again, you, if you're being honest, you sacrifice, you sacrifice relationally. You sacrifice those for things. You've gotten in fights with your spouse or your kids about that, that issue or that habit. Maybe, maybe you've, got a, you've got a habit, or you wouldn't call it an addiction, but other people have called it an addiction. And they've tried to call you out on it. They've tried to sit back and sit back and go, hey, hey, you need to stop that. You've got a problem. And you keep fighting back going, no, I can quit any time and I can do that. And I don't have to go there and I don't have to look at that. And I don't have to see that and I don't have to drink that or whatever. But again, you've got some people that care about you around you. that are sitting back kind of pushing you a little bit in this area. And it's causing some relational conflict of people that you would say you love. And yet you're not willing to sacrifice the things you love. For those you love, there's, there's a tension there because, listen, if we're really, really honest, every single person in here, I don't know what it is, you have some things you love. For some of you, maybe it's relationships, okay? You wouldn't think about people as a thing, but yet how you treat them is a thing. You, you go from relationship to relationship to relationship to relationship to relationship to best friend to best friend to new best friend to new best friend to new boyfriend, new girlfriend, whatever, whatever. And again, they're people, but... In your mind, it's just a notch. It's just the next step. It's a thing. Every single person in here, you have a thing. And if we're not careful, if we're not really, really careful, we will put those things above those we love. And today, I want to I unpack a passage. It's in Matthew chapter 19. It's a story that really is just, I, I've never heard it preached uh, as far as salvation goes. But, but really, we're going to look at a story. 
of a guy who really wants to be saved. He wants who wants to go to heaven, and, and yet he asks some really, really interesting questions. And more importantly, Jesus' response is nothing what I would expect it to be. And so we're going to pick up a story about things, and it says this, Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? So, so he starts off, and I want to be abundantly clear. This story is about salvation. Right? I mean, you can see this. It's not me. I'm not interpreting into it. His question, his core fundamental question is, how do I get eternal life? That, that's, that's, his, that's the thrust of it. That's the start in the genesis of the whole question. How do I get saved? What does that look like? That, that's his whole deal. And what Jesus said is so fascinating. Listen, let me just pause real quick and ask you the question, though. If somebody walked up to you and said that, what would you say? Some of you might quote John 3, 16, you know, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We love John 3, 16. It's a story about Nicodemus, really, really smart guy. And, and in that phrase, we get a lot of our salvific kind of language where it says things like be born again. Love that passage, John chapter 3. It's a great passage. Some of you might go there. Some of you might go to Romans, you know, chapter 6, very last verse in that, wages of sin is death. For you give to God is eternal life. I mean, you know, you go to different places, what I, what I know, what I'm assuming is you're probably not going to go where Jesus goes. Because his response is so different. It's what I love about the Bible because every time I think I got kind of God figured out and the Bible figured out, it takes me for a sharp right turn. And here's what he says. Why do you ask me what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. To which, this is so, so interesting because he says a couple things in here. One of them is this. Jesus kind of dresses and he says, listen, you're calling me good as if I'm some sage, as if I'm some wise kind of prophet or whatever. That's not who I am. I'm not good. I'm either God or I'm crazy, but I'm not good. There, there's no in between. And in our culture, I think that's important to notice today. Because there's a lot of people in our culture that sit back and go, yeah, I like Jesus. He's kind of cool. No, he's got some really good stuff to say. He's a smart guy. I like him. He's spiritual. I'm spiritual like Jesus. And Jesus kind of addresses, because this happened back then. Hey, Jesus, what do I got to do to get eternal life? He's like, no, no, first off, we got to establish this. I'm God. Okay? I'm not just a good guy. I'm not just a wise sage. I can give you advice. I'm God. Don't call me good. That's not who I am. But then he says this. This is so interesting to me. He says, keep the commandments. You want to go to eternal, you want to go to heaven? Here's the deal. Be perfect. Keep all the commandments. All 633 just nail them down. Go. Now, somebody says that to me. I'm instantly thinking, oh, I broke every one of them, I'm pretty sure, 14 times. You know, like, I just, I, I don't even have all 633 memorized, but I just, I'm positive I've broken them all some way, somehow, at my point in my life. But here's what he says. It's so fascinating to me. Which ones? <laughs> I love that. It reminds me of a time uh, I got pulled over. I was driving way too fast. Anybody ever get pulled over when they're driving way too fast? Okay, listen, we have a police department for a reason, okay? A bunch of liars. Uh, you know, so anyway, I'll, I'll be real, okay? You can all be fake out there. I was pulled over, okay, cool. Um, and I got pulled over for driving way too fast. And I'll never forget the moment. I was flat out flying. I was racing somebody else. Not a great story. Uh, and the cop came up, and he's like, he's like, Son, you, I was like 16, okay? He's like, you know how fast you were going? And literally, my first response was to be me, sarcastic, go, at what point in time, officer? Which did not end well at all for me, just by the way. So uh, that's what this reminds me of. It's like, hey, which, which one, which point are you wanting me to listen to you at? You know, um, but isn't that what we do? Is, isn't, isn't that what we do with God? Oh, there's hundreds of commands. And, and we go to church, and we pick and choose which ones we want to listen to. We, want, we pick and choose. Oh, I would never lie. But I'm going to gossip like crazy. Oh, I would never, I'd never shoot somebody. But man, I'm going to create so much drama on Facebook, it's not even funny. Oh, I would, I would never go over here. I mean, did you hear about that one person? I heard about them. I can't even believe they go into church or whatever. But you know what? I'm really okay looking at and watching things that are wildly inappropriate. I mean, because... We talked about it last week. Everybody's got their issues. God, which ones are the important ones? Which ones do I really need to focus on? You're not serious about all of them, are you? To which, again, that's why this passage just, I've been spending all week with it. It's just so different because, again, if it was me, 
And somebody comes back and goes, which ones? I'd be like, you sarcastic little punk, you know, like, you know, I'm going to beat you down, kind of whole deal. I'd be like, all of them? What do you mean, which ones? It's not what Jesus says. Here's what he says. Jesus replied, you should not murder. (laughs) Okay, God, we start with that one. You should not commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't give false testimony. Don't lie about people. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, this is a fascinating thing about this, and here's why. The commandments that they would have understood would have originated with the Ten Commandments. And Jesus, there's two types of commandments. There's the first few that deal with your relationship with God. Matter of fact, they start off, don't have any other God before me. That's a relationship with God. The last of them are incredibly practical and applicable to your relationship with other people. Jesus ignores every one of the commandments about relation to God and says every one of the commandments about the relationship to other people. He says, listen. Before you even get to me, how are you doing with other people? Before you even get to whether you have another God before me, before you even get to whether you're breaking the whole image thing with gods and whole, before you even get to our relationship, listen, how are you doing with everybody else? Which ones? And again, if I'm this guy, I'm thinking, I broke most of those. I'm done already. Here's what he says. All these I have kept. The young liar said, okay? That's how I read that. I, I am perfect, Jesus. I'm good. Didn't do it, didn't do it, didn't do it. Always honored my mother and father. I mean, even out of the womb. I just came out and just said, thank you, mama. You know, never disrespectful. Always loving. Always loved my neighbor. Always put them first. Never gave false testimony. Never lied. Jesus, I'm perfect now. That's probably not true, but let's assume for a second that it is. Here's what he says. What? No, go back. What do I still lack? This, I, I want to paint a picture real quick because they, they call this guy the rich young ruler because we find out here in a few minutes he has loads and loads and loads of money. And, and here's the image. Here, here's how he sees himself at least. It may not be 100% accurate, but here's how he sees himself. I think this is so important for us as a church. He's got money. He's young, which means he's probably healthy. And he's a great person. Like, he's got it all. Matter of fact, many of you would look at him probably and go, man, must be nice. Must be nice to have all that money. Must be nice to have all that security. Must be nice to be that good. About, I mean, have you heard about him? He is the Tim Tebow of back then, okay? I mean, I, I don't know how you feel about Tim Tebow, but I love him. And if you don't, you're wrong. So we're just going to move on from that. But, you know, he's just got money, talent, can do anything. But just, I mean, just great guy. And yet, and this is the important part. This is what I want you to see. He understands, like you understand, that's not enough. He understands, and he feels it, I believe. That's why I started the conversation. How do I get eternal life? That there is a gap in his world right now. There is a gap between where he wants to be and where he is with his relationship with God, and he feels it every single day. And here is the tension. Here is the struggle for every single one of us. No one on the outside notices it. Everybody, I believe, in this outer world would look at him and go, man, if everybody could just be like Joey over there. If everybody could just be good looking and young and wealthy and serve and honor their mom and dad and never do anything wrong, man, that guy is amazing. He loves God. And he goes, and just, I don't know if he said it publicly or privately, but there's something in his world. He feels it. There's a hole. There's a hole in his soul. And he cannot fill it. And he's trying to. He's trying to in multiple different ways and multiple different areas. And what I want to ask you this morning is, what is it? What is it that's your gap? Because it's so easy for us to miss this. It's so deceptive. This is why I want to unpack this story. Because I believe that churches are filled with this person right here. That they show up every single week, and they're good. Everything on the external world, they're great. They may have a lot of money. They may have great health. Everybody else may look at them and go, oh, their marriage is so amazing. Their kids are so great. Oh, they're so amazing. Look at how good they are. They, they may do all the right things. They may not have any scandals, any issues or whatever. And yet inside, there's a gap. They realize there's something more to life than just right now. 
There's something more to life than just being a good person. That being a good person doesn't get you into heaven, and most importantly, it doesn't reconnect you with God. That was never the prerequisite. And he's struggling. And Jesus so far is kind of dragging him along a little bit, dragging him along, dragging him along. Because see, some of us believe the lie that, you know what, if I had a better relationship with my spouse, then, then my spiritual world would be okay. It's not true. If I had a better relationship with my friends, if I, because again, Jesus started the whole thing and says, hey, how's your relationship with everybody else? He's like, it's great. He goes, yeah, that's the point. You can have everything in this world. You can have this whole world and still not have God and still feel empty. And that's where he is. He's achieved it all. And he's struggling. So let me ask you, what's your gap? What's the thing for him? It's money. So we're going to see here in a minute, because here's what Jesus says. Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Again, I, I, I want to unpack this for a second, because this is so interesting. I have never heard an altar call preached on this verse, and we're not going to start today, okay? But can you imagine that? Again, the point is salvation. We're cool with John 3.16. We're great with Romans. This one, very clearly, how do I get saved? Jesus is like, you want to know the answer? Yes, how do I get saved? Sell all your money. Give it all away. Come follow me. Could you imagine a pastor standing up and like, hey, we're having an altar call today. How many people want to get saved? Everybody's like, yeah. He's like, okay, now pull out your checkbooks, okay? <laughs> I need you to write some big checks, sell all your money away, and then come forward, and we will baptize you this morning. You would shrink that church down to about four people who had nothing to begin with. And they're like, yeah, you can have it all. <laughs> like, you didn't have anything, you know. Jesus addresses his gap. Jesus addresses the thing that he runs to for security. The thing that he runs to that really is his functional savior. I believe that many of us, we have what I would call functional saviors. That we have things that we run to that really, when times get tough, when things get hard, that's really what, that's what we lean into. Yeah, yeah, we would say, oh, it's God. We would say, oh, it's whatever. But our functional Savior is, I'm stressed out today. What am I going to do? I'm going to take a drink of something. I'm having a really, really hard day, so what am I going to do? I'm just going to buy some stuff because I feel better every time I buy something. I'm going to I'm going to find a different relationship, okay? I've been out of a relationship for a while, and I just, if I could just have a man, if I could just have a woman, then I'd be better. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to substitute something. I'm going to find some drugs or I'm going to find some medication or whatever. Why? Because I'm going to lean into that. That is my functional savior. That's the thing I'm going to lean into. Because, because all of us have a gap. Every single one of us. And he looks at this guy and he goes, listen, for you, your crutch, your functional savior, what, what prevents you from really experiencing and seeing God here on earth? It's your money. You want to experience God? You want, to, you want to eternal life? You want to follow me? Cool. You've got to get rid of the thing that stands in your way. You've got to re- get rid of the roadblock. And it's not for everybody. Let me be really, really clear. I don't think God's against money. I think God loves money. God gives money. It's not people being rich. There's a lot of rich people. Matter of fact, Jesus, Jesus talked to a lot of rich people that he never said that to. So it's not everybody. What, what, what it illustrates is in John chapter 3, Nicodemus is brilliant. And so what does Jesus say? You want to get saved? Yes. Act like a baby and pretend you don't know a thing and start from scratch because that's your Savior. You lean into your head knowledge. You lean into your intelligence. Therefore, you want to get saved? Yes. Be born again, which blew his mind. But he gets to the rich guy who may or may not lean into his understandings and his knowledge and whatever. I'm assuming he does it, but leans into his money. He's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You. You don't got to be born again that way. You don't got to start from scratch because you're already at ground zero anyway, buddy. Um, your issue is money. Let me, let me ask you, what is it? What is it you're sacrificing your relationship with God for? Because you got a thing. You got a thing that you run to. You got a thing that you hold on to. You got a thing that, you know, when times are tough, it's just you eat, stress eat just like, ah, oh, just, just got to feel better. I'm having a bad day. Everybody on some level, I believe, has these things. Next verse. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. So he walks away. 
We have no clue if he comes back later. Does, that's the end of the story for him. Walks away. Walks away from God. Walks away from heaven. Walks away from eternal life. Why? Because he had a thing. And he sacrificed a thing for those. And those is a relationship with God. So what's your thing? What is it? Every single one of us, we've, we've got a thing that holds us back from really living out sacrifice and sacrificially living for God. The second thing is this. We love now. Man, we love now. We're all about being happy in the culture, right? Everything's about happy. We want to be happy now. What makes me happy in marriages, I see marriages get falling apart all the time. And, and what they'll say to me is, Nick, I'm just not happy. We, we, we sacrifice our futures for right now. And we know it's wrong. We know we shouldn't do it. We know we shouldn't take that bite. We know we shouldn't skip that workout. We know we shouldn't skip our twilight time with God. We know we shouldn't do all these things. Why? But man, it just makes us happy. I'm not having a good day. I don't have a lot of discipline. I'm just tired. I'm just weak. I'm just whatever. I got a problem. You know, whole deal. God made me that way. We sacrifice it over and over and over again. Because there's this concept, there's this thought of, you know what? Many people walk around with an ideology of heaven. They would say it. They live a life of all I have is right now. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you ask them, do you believe in heaven? Absolutely. Do you live that way? I don't know what you mean by that. See, sacrifice, sacrifice doesn't make any sense if this is all you've got. If this is all you've got right here, right now, sacrifice makes no sense. Think about it. If you didn't have tomorrow, how many of you are going to the gym today? Anybody? I'm not. Stop it. Um, no, I mean, seriously, if you don't have next week, if you don't have next month, how many of you are putting money away in a 401k? I mean, no, sacrifice only makes sense in light of eternity. Sacrifice only comes to our body, only make, we're only allowed to do it. Why? When we have an understanding that, you know what, we are here for a very short period of time. And one day we're not going to be here, but most importantly, we're going to be somewhere else. And if all we have is right now, discipline doesn't make a lot of sense. Sacrifice doesn't make a lot of sense. Planning for the future doesn't make a lot of sense. It's just right now. Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians. He says, therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. There's a lot of people in our world, I think, run aimlessly. And they wouldn't say that. But like every month, they've got a new best friend. Every month, they're starting a new business. I mean, one, one month, it's, it's, you know, I don't want to say anybody's businesses because that would be insulting to them. But anyway, you know what I'm talking about. You know, like every month, there's a different thing that you can buy on the market, and they're trying to get you to do something. Oh, and they're so excited about this product until next month when they got a brand new product that they're super excited about. You know, and they're trying to do all this kind of thing, and they're just kind of aimlessly. One month, they're on the diet. The next month, I don't think they've ever heard the word of the diet, you know? It's kind of like, oh, I take three pizzas. No, they're for me. Why do you ask? You know, I mean, just whole deal. They, they kind of walk, they, they got a different job, they got a different passion, they got a different pursuit, all the, just whatever. They're drama like crazy. I mean, you, you want to talk about an aimless person? Let me just say right now, some people, some people can look at your Facebook page and know that you are walking aimlessly because every other day you got some drama going on. Every other day you're complaining to the masses about something. Every other day, you're whining or, or just creating drama about something for everybody else to see because you just want attention, and it's just aimless. It's all over. And Paul says, listen, I don't run like that. I got a passion, and I got a purpose, and I got a mission, and that's, I'm on it. In fact, I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. Next verse. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it slave. How many of you have ever been in a fight? Whatever. Thank you for the one person, and it's a lady, by the way. Okay, thank you very much. That's awesome. I'm glad for the honesty right there. Yeah, so um, I've been in a fight. I'll be honest. Man, you guys are, you missed the false testimony part of it earlier. But, you know, I've been in a few fights, and here's what I know. If you've ever been punched, it hurts, right? I mean, it's painful, I've never, I've never been in an actual fight and had somebody punch me and thought, <laughs> like the movies, you know, the, like they get hit, they're like the really tough guy, like, Poof, you know, and the guy's like, that doesn't happen in real life. I don't care how awesome you are, you know. I've been punched, fortunately, too many times. You know, it hurts every time. And Paul writes this. He says, I strike a blow to my body. I hit myself. 
I inflict pain on myself. I inflict sacrifice and discipline on myself. And it's painful. Why, though? To make it my slave. See, somebody in here needs to hear this right now. You will either be a slave to your body or a slave to God's purpose. One of the two. That is the only option you get. Romans talks quite a bit about that. You are a slave to sin. You were a slave to your desires beforehand. You became a Christian. You're now a slave to his purposes and plans. That's it. And some of you are struggling right now with an addiction and a struggle and a problem. And you got this aimless life and you're not sure what you want to do with your life. And you're not sure where you want to go. And you're not sure where you want to spend your time and whole deal. It has nothing to do with finding you. It has everything to do with you finding God, his purpose, his plan for you. And Paul finds that. And again, sacrifice and pain make no sense in light if we just got it right now. But in light of eternity, it makes perfect sense. He says, listen, I get up, I strike a blow to my body, make a sleep, so that after I have preached others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. I got a prize coming. I'm going to win. There is eternity. And in light of eternity, what I'm doing right now may seem foolish. It may seem silly. It may seem dumb. People might look at me and go, I can't believe you spend your time doing that. I can't believe you spend your time studying your Bible. I can't believe you spend your time giving that money to that church. I can't believe you spend your time serving that church. Are you kidding me? Like, you know, have some fun. Relate. Go do something. Get out there. You're young. You're passionate. You're old. You don't have a lot of time. Like, whatever. Just do something. Do something for you. That's the way our world lives because all it has is now. But if you have eternity in sight, There is a lost and dying world out there. And right now, let me tell you, there's some women who are abused. And they don't know God. And they're trying to figure out how to get through the day. And God loves them passionately. And we need to be ready to receive them. There's some men who've lost jobs. And more than a job, they lost confidence in who they are and what they can do and their value because they grew up in a home where they were told over and over and over again that you are what you do. And they're struggling. And they don't know God. And we need to be ready to receive them. There are stories after stories. There are women who have committed abortions and struggle with guilt and shame. There are people who have committed adultery and messed up. There, there are people who have done heinous, terrible, terrible things. And there are people like the rich young ruler who are just, they're great in every single way, and yet they're broken on the inside. And I'm telling you right now, we need to view them in light of eternity. To not look at them and go, here's five bucks, hope you have a great day. But sit back and understand, there's a place that I'm going to sacrificially serve and give to and, and do whatever I can. Why? So that they can spend eternity somewhere. Because everybody spends eternity somewhere. Everybody does. And the problem is, when it comes to sacrifice with the local church, we will sacrifice and die for our kids. Why? Because we understand, for the most part, if everything goes right, I'm going to die one day. My kids are still going to be here. And I want that legacy to go on. And the church has an even farther legacy. It's got a much bigger legacy than your children, than my children. That everybody, everybody's going to spend eternity somewhere. And Paul writes this and he goes, yeah, I bust my body up so that I can preach to others. My whole world's about, listen, I want, my, I want my life, I want what I say, what I do, what I wear, what I breathe, where I go, who I spend my time with, who I don't spend my time with, where I don't go. I want that to communicate the gospel to everybody. And that means I'm not going to do some stuff. That means I don't have money to do everything I want to do. That means that I'm going to serve in some areas that maybe I don't really want to serve in some areas, but I'm going to do that. Because it's not comfortable. It's not happy. It's a discipline. Because Glasgow needs this church. I believe that. That's why we started it. He does this. But again, I started today off talking about how we tend to miss this with the church, don't we? You have two army men in your seats. Uh, I forgot to explain this first service. So my son looked at me before I walked up on stage. He's like, Dad, don't forget that again. That would be bad. So thinking about that. You have two army men in your seats. I don't know about you. I grew up playing with these things. I would line them up. And we get a ball, and we'd roll them and play war with them, you know? I'm not going to ask if anybody ever did that, because your participation so far has been terrible. So I'm just going to assume that you all did that. I don't want to make you more liars than you already are. But I, 
I put this in your seat for a reason. I want you to take them home. I want you to put them somewhere to remind you. We're in a battle. Paul understands we're in a battle. We're in a war. There's a, there's a ship that was built specifically for war. I don't remember the time period, but it was around the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. In America, if you were alive or then, and if you're a history person, you know the whole story that we were worried that we were going to have to invade them and go to war with them, and it was really, really close. We were really, really close to a war with Cuba. And one of the ships that was built was a, 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 a transport battleship, big battleship. It was going to transport thousands and thousands of people. I think it was like 15,000 people. And its sole purpose, transport men into battle, set up, had small rooms with like triple bunked cots, you know, hold you fit 10, 12, 15 people in a room, you know, whole deal, get them in there. And its sole purpose was to transport people for the purpose of war into that situation. That was it. Well, we never went to war, so it's never used. Later on, it was sold. The military sold it off. It didn't have a use for it. They sold it off. They sold it to a luxury cruise line situation. And they took it, and they, they gutted it completely. They took all the cots out because no one wants to sit in a room with 10, 15 people. I mean, could you imagine going on a cruise? Hey, here's your bunk mates. Enjoy. You know, I mean, nobody wants that. No, they pulled out all the cots, and they put in pretty little things, and they, I'm sure, softened it up and re- removed some of the metal. And, they, and I'm positive they didn't call it the mess hall. I mean, nobody wants to eat at the mess hall, right, you know? They, they gave some fancy names, and they put it in a different kitchen and made it a whole lot nicer. And it, and it went from transporting thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people to transporting about 1,400 people because its purpose changed. Same battleship, same boat, same, same container, same thing, but the purpose was different. And the problem that I think we have right now today is too many people in the world, they think the church is a cruise ship when really it's a battleship, that we are at war. We are constantly at war. We don't talk about this a lot. I'm actually working on a series we're going to do next year, probably late next year, about spiritual warfare. We don't talk about it a lot, but just so you know, we believe in heaven and hell. We believe in God and Satan. We believe in angels and demons. We believe that there is a spiritual warfare going on all the time, and that we're in the middle of it. And again, if we miss that, if it's all about now, sacrifice doesn't make sense. If we miss that, and it's all about now, that listen, warfare doesn't make any sense. You just kind of keep the peace and just get through the day and the whole deal. There will not be peace until we are dead and gone and Jesus comes back. But too many people walk to the church and they treat it like a cruise ship. And again, as I said in the very beginning, it, 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 it starts with a pastor, a very well-meaning pastor, I believe, who sits back and says something like, hey, just give your life to Jesus and we're going to carry you to paradise. This church can be your cruise ship and we're going to take you there. And we got Monday night, you know, buffet of Bible studies and we got some small groups and some Sunday school for you and I'm your captain I'm your pastor and I'll, I'll lead you there and I'll take care of all your needs and just you know kind of show up and give your life to Christ it'll be amazing won't you do that people say yes to that and they treat the church like a cruise ship they complain about things like oh, I don't like the songs that they sing and I don't like this and I don't like the temperature and could you make it colder could you make it hotter could you do this could you, make your, could you go deeper? Could you go less deep? Okay, that was really deep. Could you do, you know, whatever? And that's what happens. That's what happens if the church is a cruise ship. Is, it, is the purpose of a cruise ship is about me. It's about serving me. And in fact, here's the issue. The purpose of a cruise ship, if you're on a cruise, you judge a good cruise by this one question. Did I enjoy it and am I happy? Period. That's it. Do I like it? Could you imagine if you judged a battleship by that? Could you imagine if, you, I don't know much about the military, okay, but just imagine you're a private, okay, and you walk up to your commanding officer and you're like, uh, sir, um, there's uh, people in my bunk, okay? <laughs> I'd like a private room for this trip that we're going to Cuba for to fight people. Could you imagine how that would go? Or, or if you were doing calisthenics in a room and, and you walk up to your officer and you're like, hey, uh, excuse me, uh, it's a little warm in here. Could you please turn it down? Okay, thank you, sir. I mean, I, I don't know much about the military. I, I got a feeling it wouldn't go very well for you at all. Because the purpose is different. When you sign up to the military, you sign up to do one of the greatest things ever in the history of the world. It's to sacrifice. You sacrifice your life, your passions, your future, your purposes. Why? Because there's something bigger and something greater than what you're living for right now. And the same thing is true of the church. The same thing is true as a Christian. If you're here today and you say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Listen, I just, you need to know what you signed up for. And I don't know what you, somebody sold you, but let me tell you what you really signed up for. 
You signed up to sacrifice your future, your passions, your purpose, your issues, your stuff for his world and his kingdom, period. And it's not about what you like. Oh, listen, hey, we, we try to do a good job. We try to make it as relevant, inspiring, helpful, and whole deal. And listen, you come, we give out cards. I mean, listen, I'm not trying to say that we want you to have this boring, terrible time. That's not the point. The point is this. We have a very specific mission to make it easy for everyone to find and follow Jesus. And if this is your church, you're part of the team, whether you want to be or not. You might not be a great part of the team, okay? <laughs> but we're all in this together. And as a church, if we're going to be effective in the fall, if we're going to be effective reaching more and more people, it's going to require all of us understanding. We will sacrifice the things we love for those we love. So here's what I'm asking you to do this week, okay? For everybody, whether you're a guest here today or whatever, for everybody, I want to ask you one simple question. What's your gap? What's the thing that's standing in the way between you and the life that God's called you to live? What's that thing? It could be money. It could be a hobby. It could be a relationship. I don't know what it is. It could be a lot of stuff. But what is the thing that you run to instinctively instead of God? When you're having a bad day, what's that thing you run to? Do you run to God or do you run to something else? Do you run to a person? Do you run to a substance? Do you run to a thing? What is it? Because you've got to get rid of that. If you want to have a relationship with God, you've got to walk away from that. You've got to walk away from Facebook. You've got to walk away from the drama. You've got to walk away from the issues. Come on. You know that. That's the first thing. Second thing is this. I want to ask you if you'd say, if you'd say hey, Nick, this is my church. I show up here. If somebody asks me, hey, do you have a church? I say River Lake Church is my church. If you're a guest or you've been here a few weeks or whatever, it's not for you. You hang out and you kind of get to see what we're about and you make some decisions later. But if this is your church, here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm, I'm asking you, I need you. We're all going to sit together. I need you to serve. I need you to sacrifice the things that you love. Maybe you're sleeping in. Maybe, I don't know what it's going to cost you. I need you to sacrifice the things that you love for those you love. For your neighbor. For, this, for, the, for the mom that I was talking about earlier. For the people that you don't even know, but five years from now are going to be so integral in your life. And it's going to happen that way because you sacrificed today. You stepped up and said, I'm not going to make my world about you. And here's really what I'm asking you to do, because I just want to break it down so clearly for you. We're asking everybody to attend one and serve one. Because here's what I think happens. It gets really easy when you start to serve to just attend the service that you serve. Unless you're in kids' ministry, which if you're a kids' ministry worker, thank you so much. You guys are all amazing. I know that Lisa needs some kids' ministry workers, especially for 11 o'clock. So if you're open to that, she would love to talk to you today, tomorrow, through the app, through me, through whatever. It'd be great for her. You know, but they, they serve and then they, they attend. But, but so often if you're in a connection team, if you're parking people, man, thank you so much for parking people, whatever. But here's what I know. You're coming in like 20 minutes late. And you just show up and you sit down and you hear the message and you walk back out and... and that's not church. I hear people talk all the time about like, oh, I heard the sermon. I heard church. No, the church is us. It's the relationship. It's the community. It's being, it's being fed spiritually, but also relationally, emotionally, physically. It's seeing the people. It's building relationships, it's the connections. And you can't do that. And so what I'm really asking everybody to do is this. Would you be willing to attend one and serve one this fall? Would you be willing to step up and go, you know what, yeah, I got this, Nick, okay? I'm going to give, because here's what I really, I'm going to give you an hour a week. I'm going to give the church an hour a week. The church that I would say, yeah, that's my church. I'm so thankful that other people step up and serve. And we've got a tech booth pe people back there. They're here, they hear me, they're going to hear me three times next week. Oh, my goodness, pray for them, okay? You know, I like what I say. <laughs> I don't know if they like it three times good, okay? You know, so just pray for them. The band, the same way. And we've got some people here that serve, and they're here all day. They're here at 6 o'clock in the morning. And some of you, you're so thankful that somebody else gets up early and serves and stays till 1 o'clock and tears down. I'm just telling you, we need you. We need you to step up. If this is your church, if it's not, that's cool. But we need you to step up and fill the gap. Because we really do believe that starting next week, we're going to see more and more and more people show up. And more and more lives are going to be impacted. And all those people out there in that lost and dying world who are struggling without hope, without grace, without mercy, my prayer, my hope is that they would find it here in this church. But it only happens if we, if the church, not the building, but if the church steps up 
and understands. We're not in a cruise ship. We're in a battleship. Could you imagine? Could you imagine if every church was filled with Christians who served every single week and gave every single week? It would change the city. It would. It would change everything. And I believe that River Lake is strategically positioned to model that, to sit back. I have other people come in and they sit back. My friend Tom came in and preached and he, he asked. He didn't even know it. I didn't tell him. He asked at one point in time, hey, could everybody that served raise your hand? And like 95% of the church raised their hand. He's like, oh, whoa, okay, cool. You know what I mean? Just it's crazy. We have that kind of church. It's awesome. I am excited about what's happening. My prayer, my hope is, I'm asking, I'm inviting you, would you join us? Would you all stand with me? I want to pray for you. If you have any questions about serving, you can talk to me afterward. You can talk to Lisa in the kids' ministry. Um, you can talk to Pat, Harlow, Connections team, or whoever. Uh, or you can go to our new website, riverlightchurch.info, we just set up, uh, and you can sign up there. For all of those of you who do serve, let me just say this. Thank you. Thank you so much for all that you do. You make this church happen every single week, and we are so incredibly grateful for that. Let's pray. God, thank you so much. I pray that you would, you would work in us to be the church. You would convict us. You would move us. Help us find whatever that gap is. And I pray that we, more than anybody else, would live out the value that we will sacrifice the things we love for those we love. That we would love this world that you've put us in. That we would love it enough to sacrifice. That we would understand and walk with a sense of warfare is in front of us. Thank you so much. And I pray for next week that it's going to be an incredible kickoff as we start something brand new in our life of our church. We love you and thank you so much. Amen. God bless. Have a great weekend.